Two weeks ago, we looked at Christ's authority over diseases and how that after his, uh, in Matthew's account, after the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, the people who listened to Jesus were amazed because uh, he spoke to them as one having authority, not as the scribes taught. The scribes just kind of got up and repeated stuff and uh, yeah, they had good answers and they had a good knowledge of God's word, but, but maybe there was something in the way that Jesus presented information. He, he spoke about it on a personal level. Like he knew and understood exactly why all these things uh, should be the way they are. Uh, but after those words, he puts the words into actions. And that's what Matthew's account really points out to us, I think. His authority, not just in, in speaking the words of God, but healing people. And then last week we talked about his authority over disciples. And we talked about how that uh, after he had done some healing, he said, it's time for us to leave, let's get in the boat and go. And some of his disciples get in the boat and some are standing outside on the shore probably and saying, Lord, I'd go with you anywhere. <laughs> Okay, foxes, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I've got nowhere to lay my head. And it's kind of like, oh, wow, you know, this isn't going to be any fun. This isn't going to be a fun trip. And another man came to him and, and said, uh, after I bury my father, I will come. And he was probably looking for the inheritance. But the authority over the, the disciples, and Jesus talked about, unless we're willing to pick up a cross, daily and follow after Jesus, we're not really being disciples. We're just uh, kind of going through the motions and Karen and I were listening to the 60, uh, yeah, the 60s on 6 on Sirius this morning and heard an, uh, from 1962 of Brooke Benton's song that talked about that uh, the church on uh, Sunday and the rest of the day of the week, you know, six nights of fun. And, and the, the next part of that was kind of the message, the odds of us going to heaven in that context are six to one. Okay? Six to one, we're not going to make it. So, you know, we've got to be disciples on an everyday basis. Now, think about what some people believe about Christianity, what they teach about Christianity, and we wonder why, uh, you know, there are so big churches out there, mega churches they call them anymore, and they teach a health and wealth gospel. If, you will, if you'll just do what God says, you're, you're going to be healthy and you're going to be wealthy. And he's going to, well, that may not always be the case, and particularly with what the Bible teaches. Contrary to what some people believe and teach, Jesus allows his disciples to suffer, put that in quotes because there are many ways of suffering, so we can know he is more powerful than our afflictions. If we go through this life never having a care in the world, I mean, everything's just taken away from us, then what kind of people are we going to be? Probably a spoiled, pampered, very weak people. Because we know that God chastises those whom he loves. And he allows us to suffer these afflictions so that we will learn to trust him more and more on a day-to-day -day basis. The storms of spiritual life are characterized by the physical storms of nature. And that's particularly so in the scriptures. Uh, we're going to be looking at the disciples and Jesus in a boat, on a lake, in a storm. But physical storms aren't the only storms that we have. We have spiritual storms, but Jesus is Lord 
of both the physical storms and the spiritual storms. And yes, he will let us go through some physical storms to understand we live in a fallen world, we need to trust him, and he'll let us go through some spiritual storms to exercise us spiritually, to see if we will come through them in a, a, a good way, to be prepared for the world that's coming, the next, the next step of our journey. So, with our lesson today, we see that as disciples of Jesus, nothing that nature throws at us can harm us if we have a right relationship with God. It, the storms can kill us, but it's going to be all right because we have that hope of eternal life. Now, there we go. You've no doubt seen the devastation that occurs with hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzards. You know, they're, they're just a whole host of things that nature can throw at us that that are devastating and uh, you know, hurricanes especially along the coast but these storms serve a very important ecological purpose we may not understand it completely I've talked before about how a hurricane comes through Florida or along the coast and it kind of flushes the Everglades and flushes those bayous out cleans them up a lot but listen here's some other things that that occur <coughs> Uh, uh, hurricanes help to maintain the balance of the Earth's ecosystem uh, in, in that way, flushing the, the bad things, the, the dead things out of the swamps, but also they dissipate the tremendous heat that builds up at the equator. Imagine if there wasn't air moving around and then the high, low pressures that eventually result in the hurricanes, how hot it would get along the equator. The hurricanes help to moderate, dissipate that heat buildup. Hurricanes are responsible for much of the rainfall in North and South America and wetlands. That's where it comes from. We, we talk about, well, yeah, we need rain. Oh, we'll get it when we need it, won't we? You know, <laughs> right, right, right at the last minute, right when we need it the most, it's going to come. But, but they need it in those wetlands in particular. The rainforests. Now, they need rain to be a rainforest. There's so much vegetation there, and they're so important to the ecology of, of this world. Meteorologists have come to realize that hurricanes do more good than they do harm. Now think about that. What harm do hurricanes really do? It's the man-made stuff. It's the, the stuff that we put there in their way and don't build it to to withstand those forces of nature that are going to come along. But in nature, just nature itself, they're a necessary thing. So uh, we see that, you know, we've got to have these storms of life. And uh, dis the disciples, in this case, were so overcome with fear, they couldn't see the potential good of going through this storm. Being there with Jesus, Jesus leading them through this storm. So when the fear of worldly things dominates our lives, we become of no use to the Lord. We become of no use to God. When, when fear uh, makes us do things that uh, God would not want us to do, then we've got a problem. See, the fear is actually leading us rather than God. The fear is leading us away from God rather than God leading us through the fear. Think of the one talent man. We talk about him quite often, Matthew chapter 25, 14 through 30 is the parable of the talents. But, but think about that one talent man. Because of fear, he went out and he buried his talent in the earth. He didn't use it for his Lord. It was just all wiped up like, like right here. Uh, here it is. I've got it for you. I didn't lose it. But there should have been a gain that was there. But fear kept him from doing what he needed to do to be successful with his level of talent. He was a one talent man. He wasn't a three and he wasn't a five. Okay, He was a one, but even that one was so very important and especially on his part. How many talents do we have? 
well, I don't know. I don't know if God's uh, allowed me to explore or whether I have not explored my talents fully. I don't know. Maybe maybe we don't know. I know with every step that, that we take, God gives us a little more responsibility. The more talents we use, a little bit more kind of comes our way of, of how we use that for others. So, uh, instead of letting fear dominate our lives, we should let God dominate our lives when it comes to moments of fear. When the fear of God dominates our life rather than the fear of worldly things, He protects us. He forms that protection around us. So He, he puts that hedge around us. It's kind of like the shield put up on the rock, you know. On the rock, the winds can swirl all the way around, but there you are. You're going to be solid. You're going to be safe. And Solomon understood that way back in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Remember, Solomon was a man who faced a lot of storms in his life because of the choices he made. You can't have 300 wives, or what is it? 300 wives, 600 concubines? 700. 700 wives, 300 concubines? Okay. You can't have that many women around and not have some struggles in life. Okay? That's a joke. Lance <laughs> thought I was serious. He was like, I understand what you mean there. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> but, 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 no. But he understood because uh, if you read that book of Ecclesiastes on, in context, it's like here, here's a man who was trained in, in, uh, in God's ways and knew them and then decided, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the way everybody, look at the world the way everybody else does, and I'm going to try that out and see if it works. And he gets through that, and he finds out it didn't work. So what, what is the end of the matter? All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. He tried the worldly stuff. He tried materialism. It didn't work. Didn't bring him happiness. All those wives and concubines didn't bring him joy and peace. It just complicated his life so much. Philippians 4.13 Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And I think that's, that's true for us too. What does it mean, do all things? We can do everything that God asks us to do. We can't go out and sin with impunity because God doesn't ask us to do that. He asks us to avoid that. But what God asks us to do, we can do it. It's not that difficult. It's just we need that, that, uh, that uh, encouragement of God in our lives moving us forward, moving us upward throughout our lives. The disciples, whoops, okay. My machine's a little slow today. All right. We don't need to be afraid in a storm if Jesus is at our side. And that's kind of the lesson that we have, or the disciples here learned, and the lesson that we should learn from them. <coughs> because, again, Jesus chastises his disciples. The Lord chastises us to make us stronger. So, yeah, he'll let us get into situations to prove that he is over those situations if we will trust in his way. Matthew 8, 26, And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. He wasn't upset because they disturbed his sleep. You know, our God, according to what, Elisha, uh, Elijah, you know, when he was on Mount Carmel and uh, disputing with the priests of Baal and Ashtoreth, you know, hey, you get your sacrifice ready, I'll get my sacrifice ready. You go ahead, you do yours. Call down fire from heaven. And whoever's, you know, sacrifice is burned up, you know, he'll be the winner. And they were over there chanting and singing and, and all this, and cutting themselves, you know. 
and hey, be a little, little louder. Maybe your God is asleep. Wake him up. But we don't have to wake up our God. Jesus was asleep here in the boat, but yet God, God does not sleep. He does not slumber. He's always willing to listen to us and, and to providentially help us. It's not that Jesus' sleep was disturbed that upset him. And it's not that they asked him to calm the storm that upset him. What upset him was their lack of faith. Thinking that with him there, that somehow they wouldn't be safe. And they wouldn't get through the storm. Their being afraid had made their faith shrink. And we talked about that before when we looked at it from the disciples' point of view. And that shrink means it's made little. Oh, you of little faith. You've got to be careful that our faith doesn't shrink. You put a, a sweater in a, in a dryer, then it's liable to shrink, right? So don't put it in the dryer. Listen, when trials of life come and afflictions come, stay strong so your faith doesn't shrink. Make your faith grow. That's what the purpose of those trials and, and tribulations are. Is that the proper? Is, are, are. Okay. Sometimes Jesus calms the storms when we ask him to. Mostly, he just calms us. Right? We, we want the wrong thing, don't we? Lord, take away my affliction. Lord, take away this storm. No. Lord, help me to be calm in this storm. Help me to be faithful. Help me to be strong. Scientists tell us it's perfectly calm in the eye of the storm. You ever see those pictures of the, the planes? You know, they go through the outer edge of that storm and the plane's just shaking and then all of a sudden, just very still, you know, and you can see the clouds swirling around that eye of the hurricane, and, and sometimes it's like 150 miles an hour that the, the winds are blowing around there, be it the it is. Calmness, perfect calmness. And that's what God wants us to experience in Jesus Christ when the storms of life come to us. Jesus tells us that that is what his disciples do experience in a storm. Look at John 16, verse 33. Again, remember where this is, the night before Jesus is crucified, right? And he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So here's it is. Are we in the world or are we in Christ? What dominates us? Say, we can be in the world, but if we're in Christ and Christ dominates us, doesn't matter what the world's doing. We're there in the eye of the storm. We're watching all this stuff happening around, happening around us. Guy asked me yesterday, aren't you worried about uh, all this stuff uh, going on? No, not really. You're not worried about the North Koreans getting nuclear weapons? No, because we know we got enough missiles to shoot them down <laughs> if they start. We don't have enough the Russians attack or the Chinese attack, but we got enough the North Koreans attack. We, we can take care of that. Well, aren't you concerned that the Russians uh, released a nerve agent and killed a couple people? No. Well, they could, they could drop it on a whole city. Man, well, they probably could. But, you know, I can't do anything about it. I can't stop it. I don't want to be a part of it. But if it happens, how am I going to react? Is that going to, to uh, make me stop believing in God? Well, absolutely not. I have to get closer to God, see? And that's the point that, that is there. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, uh, the Apostle Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything. Well, if I'm not to be anxious about anything, what can I be anxious about? It doesn't ever, okay? But mainly, don't be anxious about God's power to save. Jesus' power to save. 
and to protect us even if it means taking us out of this world on to the next level. All right? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace. That perfect peace. So when we encounter afflictions, we need to grow in faith, knowledge and intimacy with God. It needs to be a growing experience, a maturing experience. Okay, Rather than something that knocks us back in faith, makes our faith shrink, it needs to make our faith grow. And it's going to depend upon how we look at it. Jesus knows that everyone needs to grow spiritually. No matter how great we get spiritually, we're still human beings, we still need to grow spiritually to ever get close to, to match him and his spirituality. No human being ever reaches a point where they do not need to improve. We're just, we're works of art. Again, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Uh, God, through the Holy Spirit, continues to work on us providentially. Okay? We don't know what he's doing, but, but there it is. And he allows some of these storms of life to, to help us to grow. We've got to experience them. Uh, the stormy experiences, they are unpleasant, but we can be assured that the Lord is always in control of every circumstance. See, it can happen, but he's, still, he's the ultimate power the ultimate authority behind that. So if, even if it does mean harm, even if it does mean death, he can overrule that in eternity. <coughs> Matthew, or I'm sorry, Romans 8, 28. Jesus works all things together for good if we love him and conform to his plans. That's what that's saying there. If we conform to his plans, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things, uh, for, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. What does that mean, called according to his purpose? Purpose? His purpose. Yeah. Could have said he's dolphin, and that would have been crazy. But, but conform to his plans. We have to conform to his plans. <coughs> what we try to do is conform God to our plans, right? We, we, we try to justify what we're doing. Well, well God's okay with this. We, we can't know that. But uh, we have a sovereign Lord who's able to take every delay, every problem, and every person and work them all for our greater conformity to the image of Christ. So Jesus wants us to look beyond the storms to his reassuring words when the disciples saw, saw the stormy seas and the waves spilling into the little fishing boat, they let fear control their thinking. Remember what fear is? False evidences appearing real. False evidences appearing real. That's what fear is. It's, it's false. Don't be afraid because it's not about this world. It's about eternity. Uh, they let fear control their thinking. But say 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith's what controls us. Our faith directs us. Our faith, if it doesn't shrink, will see us through all those storms. You see, Jesus is more interested in our character development than our worldly success. And that's what he talks about in Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? God is wise enough to know that you can teach some people by what you say. You can teach a little more by what you do, but you teach most effectively through what you are. And that's the character development part of it. That's what conformity to Christ is. 
developing our character in harmony with his character. Somebody said character is what you are when you don't think anyone's watching you. <laughs> okay? Well, that's, that's kind of integrity, too. Are you the same person all the way through? But, yeah, when we think somebody's watching us, we're going to be a little bit more careful. But, but character means that, that, that the same person shows up. The man in the mirror in the morning is the same man in the mirror that night before he goes to bed. That's important. Jesus' authority over nature teaches us that he also has authority over spiritual afflictions. Spiritual afflictions. We can trust him with our souls. We can trust his plan of salvation to save us. Why? Because he said the gospel, right? Here's the power of God into salvation for all who believe. You do this and I promise you that I will take away your sins. You be faithful to the gospel throughout your life and I promise to give you a crown of life. We can trust him. We can't trust anything in this world, can we? No. It may rain today, it may not. <laughs> you can't trust the you can't trust the weather man, right? <laughs> yeah. But the important thing, our God is greater than anything this world can throw at us. Amen. He is. So let's remember we're living in a fallen world, but we're citizens of a different kingdom. We have a different ruler than the ruler of this world. And it's he who will protect us and save us. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you have a need this morning, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.